Hi everybody, my name is Saeed Dabestani and I will be giving a talk on RCC follow-up uh, with uh, the questions what, when and why. I want to start by thanking the organizers of this meeting for allowing me to give this talk. So, as you all most likely know, there, there are about 400,000 cases of newly diagnosed uh, kidney cancer per year. And of those, about 80% receive curative treatment for localized disease. And of those, about 20% will develop metastatic disease within five years. The focus of this talk will be on the follow-up of these patients and what the major guidelines uh, are saying and what the updates are. So starting with the what part. So what imaging to perform in RCC follow-up? We know that imaging that is recommended by all of the major guidelines is uh, primarily CT scans. That's the gold standard. And then MRIs and ultrasounds are recommended. And then for bone metastases, if patients are symptomatic, a bone scan. And last but not least, so in some certain circumstances, PET CTs are also being used. Um, I will get to the when part later on in the presentation, but just sticking to the updates about what type of imaging to perform. One thing that's been become more and more clear in the last uh, years or so is that the whole discussion about cross-sectional versus conventional imaging of the chest. We know that many sites still use uh, plain x-rays for uh, imaging and uh, many sites have gone over to only using CT scans for imaging them at the chest. And to this end, I want to show you the graph to your uh, left, where, to your right, sorry, where you can see that it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's showing the patients that had a recurrence and it's been divided into patients with high and low volume of metastatic burden at recurrence and then again stratified by how many cross-sectional as opposed to conventional imaging these patients underwent during their follow-up period. And it's a, it's a study that we presented in, uh, from the Recur Consortium and it was published in Scandinavian Journal of Urology two years ago. And basically what it's showing us is that irrespective of uh, what type of imaging the patient mostly uh, when underwent during their follow-up, it does not change the outcome of that patient. And, and it's true for those that have a low metastatic burden, and it's true for those that have a high metastatic burden. So the point here is that it seems like it doesn't matter what type of imaging you use for the chest, even if you use a plain chest x-ray. But I will also want to point out that from a purely pragmatic or empirical uh, point of view, uh, CT scans are uh, the, the most, most uh, um, recommended choice because of the cross-sectional aspect of it and also that you can find smaller recurrences earlier, even if they're undeterminate at the time of, of, recurrence, of, of their detection, they, they will be highly, uh, be highly more likely for them to be followed up more closely with a cross-sectional imaging finding them than if you use a conventional image. Now, the, the next what question when it comes to what type of imaging to perform is the whole discussion about radiation exposure using CT scans uh, versus diagnostic accuracy, uh, meaning using other non-radiation uh, exposing uh, modalities. So I'll just briefly go through these. So for ultrasound, which is recommended by uh, some of the guidelines still, uh, the point I want to make here is that contrast enhanced ultrasound seems to be the better choice in that it has a fairly excellent sensitivity and a fairly moderately good specificity for detecting renal masses. Uh, it's, it's good at looking renal, at renal cysts and, and smaller renal masses. And this translates into it being better at looking at the kidneys in those that undergo partial nephrectomy in that you can use it where if you have a CT and an MRI scan where you're not certain about uh, if the renal mass is a recurrence or not, uh, it, it has a good role. But again, it is still user dependent. And what we're seeing is that the, the contrast enhanced ultrasound is excellent in sites where they have high volumes, but we are not as certain that that's the case in low volume centers. 
So uh, next one is the MRI, uh, which also is a, a excellent uh, imaging alternative of the abdomen. And uh, the benefits are that it can show renal vein invasion of a local recurrence better, and it can show invasion of adjacent structures better um, uh, compared to uh, CT scans. And it's also excellent for those that have contrast allergies for conventional CT scans with contrast, and also, of course, in pregnant women. Uh, these two, some updates about these two modalities uh, have been derived from the thesis by Fogel, uh, which was published in 2017. The last what thing I want to update everybody about is the whole new discussion about PSMA PET CT scans. So PSMA PET CTs have been established now for for looking at looking for um, metastatic disease in prostate cancer, but we're seeing more and more evidence suggesting that the whole principle of staining of tumor neovasculature, which the PET, uh, PSMA PET-CT detects, is, is also valid for, for RCC. The sensitivity and specificity isn't like com completely determined, but with the cases that have been reviewed and the studies that have been published, they suggest that for clear cell chromophobe, transitional cell carcinoma, and for oncocytoma, they're, they're actually quite, the PSMA PET-CT is actually quite good at detecting uh, recurrent sites. Um, uh, uh, the evidence is a bit hazy about papillary RCC though. Uh, good. So moving on to the when part, when should patients be followed up? Uh, I won't go through each uh, follow-up step, but, but I, what I will do is I will talk about the updates of the latest major guidelines. Starting with the EAU guidelines for 2021, the big difference this time around is that the recommendations are stratified into low, intermediate, and high risk, but based on not only the risk of recurrence, but also based on different scoring systems if you have clear cell or non-clear cell RCC. And the main principle is that the higher risk you have of, of recurrence, according to these risk profiles, the more in intensive imaging frequencies, and the more, the more uh, frequently you should be uh, getting your imaging done during follow-up. And what the EA guidelines say is basically that they recommend the Leibovitch, uh, 2003 Leibovitch model to be used for clear cell RCC, uh, while they recommend the UISS uh, staging system uh, uh, for uh, for non-clear cell RCC. The A guidelines have also included a, a couple of sentences in their recommendations about the fun functional follow-up of, of these patients, meaning their kidney and cardiovascular uh, function after their surgeries. And the, the statement is clear here that irrespective of the length of the oncological follow-up, you should be following these patients and and referring them to respective specialists, uh, depending on what type of functional complications they might, might uh, have later on in life. And last but not least, the whole discussion about uh, competing risk and life expectancy, and also patient wishes has been uh, highlighted in that uh, in those with low risk disease, th they should be counseled at three years uh, with what the benefits would be of doing more follow-up imaging on them. And uh, for the intermediate at, at five years, the same thing. The high-risk patients are recommended to be followed even after five years, but it's, uh, and, and the case is much stronger for them to be followed more than five years. The AUA guidelines, they, uh, they haven't updated their guidelines on follow-up since 2013. They still base it on if the patient have, has performed a partial or radical nephrectomy uh, in smaller renal masses. And then if it's a higher, uh, so larger the renal mass, meaning PT2A or larger, uh, these patients uh, should be uh, followed in more, more frequently, basically. They also provide uh, follow-up recommendations for active surveillance patients and for those that undergo ablative techniques. Last but not least, 
when it comes to the NCCN guidelines, they also provide uh, follow-up recommendations for active surveillance and, ab and ablative techniques. Uh, the NCCN guidelines is the one that has that recommends uh, the most exhaustive uh, follow-up scheme. And they base it on which stage the patient is in. Uh, and what they also recommend in their updated guidelines from 2021 is uh, recommendations for those that have undergone adjuvant therapy uh, for after they've been surgically treated for their localized disease, but also those that have a recurrent disease and those that have surgically unresectable disease. All three guidelines, all three major guidelines have the same principle in that the higher your risk is of, of having a recurrence, the, the more frequently you should be followed. And all three also say that CT scan is your uh, first choice. Uh, MRI scans and ultrasounds are alternatives which can be used if and when necessary. Uh, another thing that is also common is that all three recommend that you counsel patients at three or five years on um, their risk of getting a recurrence uh, versus uh, other risk factors of non-RCC related death. So that brings us into the discussion about when we should stop doing follow-up. And to date, the, the best study that has tried to answer this question is the one by Stuart Merrill, uh, which was published in JCO in 2015, where they basically looked at patient recurrence patterns and they uh, did a Vable graph analysis of recurrence in the chest and in the abdomen, and then uh, weighted it against what type of comorbidities the patient had and also what type, uh, what age the patient had. The, the graphs in front of you are just examples. Uh, with those that have few comorbidities and those that have uh, uh, more more than uh, two uh, two or more com comorbidities, uh, according to the Charlson Comorbidity Index, and what they could show uh, basically was that they could pinpoint the time point where your risk of of non-RCC death would be higher than your risk of uh, RCC related rec sorry, RCC recurrence actually. In the Recur Consortium, uh, which I'm a part of, we also looked at the competing risks. Uh, and we basically could show that for low risk disease, after about a year, you have a higher risk of non RCC related death than having a recurrence. For intermediate risk, this with the, the cutoff was at around five years. But while for high risk patients, you would always have a higher risk of getting a recurrence than uh, an, an, uh, death by other cause. This is uh, specifically for clear cell RCC, uh, I have to point out. Uh, for in the same study, we also looked at the age perspective and without going into too many details, low, intermediate and high risk patients uh, were assessed depending based on um, those that were young, younger than 60, those that were between 61 and 75 and those that were above uh, 70, 67 year, years or above. And basically what we could see that is that high risk patients will always have a high risk of RCC related death. Intermediate risks uh, change over time. The older you get, the higher your risk of, is, is of dying uh, uh, from another cause. And uh, while in the low risk patients, actually even for the youngest patients, uh, their risk of, of uh, death of other causes would be higher than, than dying from RCC. Moving on to the why part. So why do follow up? And it, it could be kind of summarized down to that early detection is what you want and you want to find patients that are asymptomatic at recurrence. Um, this was nicely shown both by us in the Recur Consortium but, but, but also by Merrill in that those patients that had a symptomatic recurrence had a poorer survival compared to those that had an asymptomatic recurrence. So this is the main point of, of the why question, why do follow up? And it's to, to, to find these patients early on before they get uh, become symptomatic because they, we know that they have a poor survival when they are symptomatic. And then of course the potential for cure if they have a low metastatic volume. And uh, in those cases where you, you cannot cure them, which is most of the cases, unfortunately still, at least allow prolonged survival 
And this was shown in the Lancet Oncology paper where, where it was a systematic review where we reviewed metastasectomy versus uh, incomplete metastasectomy or no, no focal therapy. Uh, the Recur Consortium is now trying to look at the granular data. We are trying to figure out if there are subsets of certain subtypes of RCC which could benefit from even less follow-up than what we're recommending right now. As an example, this was published uh, just a few days ago. Um, and it's, uh, we looked at those with low risk chromophobe RCC where we could basically see, see that if you had a tumor that was smaller than PT2A and you didn't have any risk factors, meaning sarcomatoid differentiation, uh, the PT stage I mentioned, coagulative necrosis in the tumor or a positive surgical margin, these patients had a very low risk, extremely low risk of a recurrence uh, within uh, uh, actually up to 10 years. And so we recommend that we recommend in our study that these patients with low risk chromophobe RCC should maybe just do one imaging uh, at around two years after their surgery. And then at three years, if, they, uh, if they're healthy and don't show any symptoms, they should be counseled about uh, no need of further follow-up, alternatively only symptom-based follow-up. Future perspectives on RCC follow-up, there are two things to, to, to be said. One is that the holy grail that everybody's looking for would be ideal, meaning having a blood or, and or urine-based uh, biomarker for follow-up instead of imaging, which is the standard of care today. Uh, to this end, there is one study that's looking at this. It's a cohort study that is a diagnostic accuracy study. So that means level 1B level of evidence. And it's the Aurorax 81A study, where we're trying to see if glucose aminoglycans uh, um, distilled down to GAG scores, if there is a biochemical GAG score recurrence, if uh, we were looking if, if it, is, uh, it has a high sensitivity and specificity for detecting recurrence compared to the standard of care imaging. Um, I won't go into too much details of the study, but it's a, it's a multi-center study. Uh, we have uh, lots of sites in Europe and in North America running this study right now. We, we think we will have preliminary results in 2023. Uh, last future perspective is of course, discussion about what happens to follow up after new, adju new adjuvant and adjuvant uh, treatment. And it, it could be argued that we will might, might, might need more follow-up imaging in those patients to receive adjuvant treatment because we want to see that they have no evidence of disease. Or the case might be that the efficacy of the treatments will be so good that less imaging will be needed because they, they will uh, have good treatments for their micrometastatic disease. So in conclusion, cross-sectional imaging provides more granular data and potential for early detection. It's an empirical statement. PSMA PET-CT is showing some promise, will the future will tell. Major guidelines, they differ still, and, but they have the same principles on how to do follow-up based on what the risk of recurrence is. Uh, I think it's important to point out that counseling patients uh, at three or five years after their follow-up on their risk of, of dying from something else uh, comp uh, as opposed to getting a recurrence is, is something that we should be doing more frequently. Um, I think that follow-up serves to allow early detection and, and potential for improved survival. And this is something that needs to be uh, addressed in future studies to, to better determine which patients uh, we should be uh, more interested in, in doing more rigorous follow-up on. And last but not least, I mentioned that the uh, uh, follow-up in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant era is still undetermined. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your attention.